Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Today we are diving into a project that's both nostalgic and fun. Building our very own Game Boy using a modern age microcontroller. They said it wasn't humanly possible. All the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Let's rewind a bit and appreciate how the original Game Boy, released by Nintendo in 1989, revolutionized handheld gaming. Before the launch of the Game Boy, portable gaming was largely a niche market, but Nintendo's little grey box changed everything. With its robust hardware, long battery life, and the library of legendary games like Tetris or Pokemon, it sent a new standard for gaming on the go. The Game Boy's strengths lay in its simple yet effective design. It featured a monochrome dot matrix LCD display, which was groundbreaking for its time and an interface that made it easy for anyone to pick up and play. The portability of the Game Boy allowed gamers to enjoy their favorite titles anywhere and its battery life was pretty impressive, lasting up to 20 hours on just 4 AA batteries. Now then, let's take that iconic concept and try to recreate the experience using something from this age, an ESP32 microcontroller. With its relatively powerful dual-core processor, wireless connectivity and ease of use, the ESP32 is a great candidate for making an emulation handheld for Game Boy games, with the added bonus of lower power consumption compared to fully-fledged single-board computers like the Raspberry Pi. So sit back and relax as I in this video will walk you through the build process I experienced from the initial design, testing and part picking to hardware assembly and coding. I must warn you though, before building your own system, which you will see is not that hard, you should watch the whole video since during the build process I found out some interesting quirks when building a handheld like this, and I would like to share that experience with you. Now then, let's start with the electronics. As I said, the main brains of the handheld is the ESP32, a dual-core microprocessor running at a staggering 240 MHz. This high clock speed allows it to have a fast connection speed to the LCD and it is able to draw the LCD at more than 30 frames per second, which is way higher than what a box standard Arduino Uno can do. The board shown here also has an external 8 megabytes of RAM, which allows the emulators to hold the game ROM in RAM for extra performance. As I couldn't find a board with the extra RAM chip, I just bought a standard development board and a module with the extra RAM separately and fused them together. I would not recommend doing it this way since there is a really high risk of damaging other components on the board and also the to be salvaged chip. Resoldering another module is way easier though, although the pads are small, a standard soldering iron can do the job. The display we are using is a 3.2 inch TFT LCD. It has a resolution of 240 by 320 pixels and communicates with the ESP32 using the SPI protocol. The LCD can comfortably run at 40 MHz communication speed, which roughly equals to 30 full frames per second of maximum bandwidth. This is more than enough for our application here, and another bonus is its low power consumption. For loading the ROMs and the firmware, an SD card reader is needed. This VEMOS compatible SD card shield is small, has the fun SD card mechanism with the spring, and it worked without any problems. As I later found out though, not every SD card will work with the ESP32. For example, the SD card shown here kept crashing the system, while a SanDisk 16GB SD card worked just fine, so keep that in mind. For charging the battery and some protection, a TP4056 module is more than enough. The new models also have USB-C, which is a big upgrade from the micro USB boards found before. The charging current of 1 amp is also plenty for our application. For regulating the voltage, I first thought to use a step-up converter in conjunction with a linear regulator for stable power, since the ESP32, although it's relatively power efficient, is quite prone to creating current spikes while enabling Wi-Fi or copying large amounts of data around. Later I replaced this with a 33 volt buck voltage regulator from DFRobot, which works amazingly well and is plenty more efficient. For the audio generation there are two options thanks to the firmware that is going to be used. 
The ESP32 has internal DAX or digital to analog converters, which can be used to create sound with the help of an external amplifier. But on some boards like mine, the noise from the nearing pins seeps into the signal and causes an annoying buzzing sound. To solve this issue, an external DAC and amplifier combo can be used to get a clearer sound. The buttons I used are run-of-the-mill 8mm by 8mm rubber membrane or soft touch buttons. I decided to try these instead of the usual tactile buttons because the tactile ones were a bit too loud because of their clicking noise and the empty 3D printed shell. So those were basically all the core parts. Let's now talk about the design a bit. First it should look like a Game Boy whilst having a better backlit LCD display. Since the 3.2 inch LCD I had didn't really fit in the original case, I had to scale up the dimensions a tiny bit. But come on, who was gonna notice that if I hadn't said it? On a side note though, by scaling the case just a bit, the job of fitting the electronics and the 18650 battery becomes a lot easier. Designing the controls was also a big chore. Trying to make the D-pad actually feel right was challenging for no reason. On all my other designs in the past years, I always put the pivot of the D-pad near the physical buttons, not on the D-pad cross itself, since that would just increase complexity. However, this time with these soft touch buttons, that technique just didn't work out. In the end, I managed to make a simple two-piece D-pad design, which was just good enough for the job. The models then need to be printed with a 3D printer in the orientation shown. Although this method creates a lot of support material that needs to be removed, it also nets a good surface finish, which matters more for handhelds like these. The buttons are meant to be printed without any support, but I suggest printing them all at once with a small layer height so that there is enough time for the parts to cool between layers for smoother and straighter parts. And of course, the design took many tries to perfect and I had to cut out some cool concepts because some parts were just not functioning properly. Originally, the idea was to put the ESP32, so the brains of the whole handheld, onto a pseudo cartridge. In this way, the Game Boy itself would just become a multifunctional hub on which you could attach different microcontrollers to. The so-called IDC connectors that I was trying to integrate had different ideas about the topic though. Not only were they too hard to attach and detach, they also all seemingly broke after reconnecting 5 times. Even when they worked, the cables were so horribly insulated that the high speed connection between the LCD and the ESP32 was constantly breaking, rendering the whole device useless. I found that out after a lot of trial and error. I recreated the circuit multiple times in order to make sure that all of the parts worked. I tried directly soldering onto the ESP32 for the most stable connection, but now I had another problem. The chip just restarted randomly. I couldn't figure out why at first. I tried a lot of different power supplies, different regulators, even different chips, but nothing worked. After a week of trying to debug the thing, I took a break, disassembled everything. And after the break I recreated the whole thing again, now on a breadboard, and just randomly tried another SD card. This time it worked on the first try. To make sure that I wasn't crazy, I tested the whole thing again with the old SD card and yes, the ESP32 started to randomly restart. Even though this SD card worked fine on many other projects and showed up fine on my PC, it just didn't like the ESP32. This is the first time I have experienced something like this, but now I know. After verifying again that the concept with the removable cartridge won't really work, I just went on and redesigned the cartridge so that I could slide an ESP32 board soldered directly into the cartridge slot. This way all the instabilities in the data transmission disappeared. Of course this means that this design isn't exactly modular, but after spending some time with the console, I'm not sure if that would even have mattered. The most fun part of the project is next, actually closing up everything. Some things are secured with screws and some of them are glued with hot glue. 
The case is then folded together and assembled using six screws. As the screen itself is made out of plastic and is easily scratchable, I would also recommend adding a screen protector, which I did. This was just cut with scissors carefully from a bigger sheet. Coding all of the emulators and optimizing them again for the ESP32 was an option, but in this case it is simply better to use the great work by Ducalex over at GitHub and the many people behind RetroGo for the ESP32. This is a firmware tailored for ESP32 handheld consoles with many built-in emulators. You only need to read the instructions and you are golden. This game console project has become one of my favorites with its usability and coolness factor being miles ahead of my older handheld projects. Designing everything and then making it all functional brought a lot of satisfaction and I hope that this video will also motivate some others to dip their toes into creating cool DIY handhelds too. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.